Hi everyone, it is September 28, 2012. This was actually posted January 5, 2012. Seven reasons America's mental health industry is a threat to our sanity. The majority of psychiatrists, psychologists, and other mental health professionals go along to get along and maintain a status quo. That includes drug company corruption, pseudoscientific research, and a standard of care that is routinely damaging and occasionally kills young children. If that sounds hyperbolic, then you probably have not heard of Rebecca Riley and how the highest levels of psychiatry described her treatment as appropriate and within responsible professional standards. Rebecca Riley, who was 28 months old, diagnosed as ADHD. That diagnose coming from her mother describing Rebecca as hyper and had difficulty sleeping. This psychiatrist, can't even pronounce his name, at the Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, prescribed a hypertensive drug with significant sedating properties a drug that was also prescribed to Rebecca's older sister and brother, clonidine. By the time Rebecca was three, she was then diagnosed as bipolar and then prescribed two additional heavily sedating drugs, the antipsychotic Seroquel and the anticonvulsant Depakote. At the age of four, Rebecca was dead. The goal of Rebecca's parents, a goal obvious to many in their community and later to juries, was to attain psychiatric diagnoses for their children that would qualify them for disability payments and to sedate their children, making them easy to manage. And the medical examiner actually did conclude that Rebecca died from intoxication of clonidine, Depakote, and two over-the-counter cold and cough medicines that led to heart failure, lungs filled with bloody fluid, coma, and then death. Rebecca's abusive parents went to prison. The psychiatrist, on the other hand, actually had loads of support. The psychiatric establishment rallied around that psychiatrist, Kafuji, enabling her to return to Tufts Medical Center practicing child psychiatry without any restrictions, penalties, or supervision. After Rebecca's death, Tufts New England Medical Center defended Kafuji. A Tufts spokesman told 60 Minutes in 2009 the care we provided was appropriate and within responsible professional standards. Apparently, psychiatric care that is considered appropriate and within responsible professional standards includes diagnoses of ADHD for a two-year-old and a bipolar disorder for a three-year-old when the symptoms of those disorders are normal behaviors for those ages. Prescribing three heavily sedating drugs that have not been approved by the FDA for child psychiatric treatment, ignoring the warnings from a school nurse about over dosages for Rebecca and making diagnoses based almost entirely on the reports of Rebecca's mother, who herself was diagnosed with mental illness and heavily medicated to the point of falling asleep in the psychiatrist's office. Long before the Rebecca Riley tragedy hit the headlines, I was embarrassed by the mental health profession for seven major reasons. First reason, corruption by Big Pharma. Congressional hearings in 2008 revealed that psychiatry's quote-unquote thought leaders and major institutions are on the take from drug companies. In June 2008, the New York Times reported about psychiatrist Joseph Biederman, a world-renowned Harvard child psychiatrist whose work has helped fuel an explosion in the use of powerful antipsychotic medicines in children earned at least 1.6 million in consulting fees from drug makers from 2000 to 2007. 
due in large part to Biedemann's influence, the number of American children and adolescents treated for bipolar increased 40 fold. 40. 4 0 40 fold. From 94 to 2003. Pediatrician and author Lawrence Diller notes about Peterman. He single handedly put pediatric bipolar disorder on the map. In addition to bipolar, Biedemann was the most significant force behind the expanding numbers diagnosed with ADHD. And a congressional investigation discovered that Biedemann conducted studies of Eli Lilly's ADHD drug Stratera, funded by the National Institute of Health, at the same time he was receiving money from Lilly. Virtually every major mental health institution is financially interconnected with Big Pharma. Congressional hearings also exposed the American Psychiatric Association, psychiatry's premier professional organization, as being on the take from drug companies. In 2006, the drug industry accounted for about 30% of the APA's $62.5 million in financing. And most relevant here, the APA is the publisher of the Psychiatric Diagnostic Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and thus the APA is the institution responsible for creating mental illnesses and disorders. The second reason, invalid illnesses and disorders. Psychiatry's first DSM-1952 and its DSM-2-1968 listed homosexuality as a mental illness only because of the fierce political fight waged in the 70s by gay activists did the APA abolish homosexuality as an illness and eliminate it from its DSM-3 in 1980. Gay activists' fight was not only a victory for themselves but a service for everyone else as it made public the important scientific problem of scientific disorder invalidity. Specifically, are psychiatric disorders scientifically valid illnesses, or are they simply behaviors that create discomfort for some authorities at a given moment in time? While psychiatry lost homosexuality as a mental illness in the 1980 DSM-3, the APA found other groups it could pathologize, groups that could not mobilize and resist, most notably children, who are now routinely given psychiatric diagnoses for behaviors that many of us view as normal for their ages. The standard for a medical disorder should not be whether or not an individual causes friction. Third reason, scientifically unreliable diagnoses. Even if you believe that bipolar disorder for three-year-olds, ADHD for two-year-olds, ODD for teenagers, and all the other DSM diagnoses are valid disorders, there is still the scientific issue of diagnostic unreliability, the lack of diagnostic agreement among professionals examining the same person. A generation ago, psychiatrists admitted that their diagnoses were unreliable and agreed that this was a major scientific problem. So in 1980, in an attempt to eliminate this embarrassment, they created the DSM-3 with concrete behavioral checklists and formal decision-making rules, but they failed to correct the problem. Psychiatric diagnoses remain unreliable, but now psychiatry no longer talks about the unreliability problem. If a measurement is a reliable one, then clinicians trained with it should be in high agreement on the diagnoses. A major 1992 study conducted at six sites with 600 prospective patients was done to examine the reliability of psychiatric diagnoses. Experienced mental health professionals were given extensive training in how to make accurate DSM diagnoses. Because of the extensive training, one would expect that diagnostic agreement would be much higher than in typical clinical settings. The study demonstrated that even when experienced clinicians with special training and supervision are asked to use DSM and make a diagnosis, they frequently 
disagree, even though the standards for defining agreement are very generous. For example, if one of the two therapists made a diagnosis of schizoid personality disorder and the other therapist selected avoidant personality disorder, the therapist were judged to be in complete agreement of the diagnosis because they both found a personality disorder, even though they disagreed completely on which one. So even with this liberal definition of agreement, reliability using DSM is not very good. Kutchins and Kirk, who did the study, concluded mental health clinicians independently interviewing the same person in the community are as likely to agree as disagree that the person has a mental disorder and are as likely to agree as disagree on which of over the 300 DSM disorders is present. The fourth reason, biochemical imbalance, mumbo jumbo. Just as nothing was more important in selling the Iraq war in 2003 than the Bush administration's certainty that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction, nothing has been more important in selling psychiatric drugs than psychiatry's certainty of biochemical brain imbalances as the cause for mental illness. Prior to psychiatry's proclamation that depression was caused by too little of the neurotransmitter serotonin, few Americans were taking antidepressants. But by declaring that depression was caused by a serotonin imbalance, analogous to diabetes and an insulin imbalance, depressed Americans became far more receptive to serotonin-enhancing drugs, such as the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft. SSRIs can make some depressed people feel better. However, alcohol makes some shy people less shy, but that's not enough evidence to say that shyness is caused by an alcohol imbalance. The truth is, and scientists have known this for quite some time, that serotonin levels are not associated with depression. Elliot Valenstein, Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Michigan, reviewed the research in his book Blaming the Brain and reported that it is just as likely for people with normal serotonin levels to feel depressed as it is for people with abnormal serotonin levels, and that it is just as likely for people with abnormally high serotonin levels to feel depressed as it is for people with abnormally low serotonin levels. He also concluded, furthermore, there is no convincing evidence that depressed people have a serotonin or norepinephrine deficiency. In 2002, New York Times reported, researchers knew that antidepressants seemed to raise the brain's levels of messenger chemicals called neurotransmitters, so they theorized that depression must result from a deficiency of these chemicals, yet a multitude of studies failed to prove this precept. Yet even now, many psychiatrists and other mental health professionals continue to promulgate the serotonin imbalance theory of depression, and polls show that the majority of Americans continue to believe it. 5. Pseudoscientific Drug Effectiveness Research There are multiple tricks that scientific drug manufacturers and their research psychiatrists and psychologists use to make their drugs look more effective than they really are. I will link below to the article if you want to read the details. I'm just going to jump to the last paragraph. Drug companies try to ensure that those studies showing antidepressants to be no more effective than placebos are not published. But independent researcher Irving Kirsch, along with his research team at the University of Connecticut, used the Freedom of Information Act to gain access to all data and analyzed 47 studies that had been sponsored by drug companies on Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Effexor, Celexa, and Serazone, discovered that in the majority of the trials, the antidepressant failed to outperform a sugar pill placebo. Even in the trials where the antidepressant did outperform the placebo, the advantage was slight. Chemists consider psychiatric prescription drugs and illegal mood-altering drugs all 
to be psychotropic or psychoactive drugs. Cocaine and ADH drugs, such as Adderall and other amphetamines, affect the neurotransmitters dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And antidepressants used in combination also affect the same neurotransmitters. Not only are prescription psychotropics and illegal psychotropics chemically similar, they are used by people for similar reasons, including taking the edge off their discomfort so they can function. The hypocrisy surrounding illegal and prescription psychotropic drugs is harmful to society in at least two ways. On one level, because people are being misinformed about the realities of prescription psychotropic drugs, they are more likely to gulp them down and to give them to their children. This has helped create a tragic phenomenon detailed by investigative reporter Robert Whittaker in his book, Anatomy of an Epidemic. Psychiatric drug use, turning mild and episodic conditions into severe and chronic ones, has helped create a huge increase of Americans with severe mental illness, especially among children. At a second level, this psychiatric illegal psychotropic drug hypocrisy allows for unfair criminalizing and incarceration of people using illegal psychotropics. 7. Diversion from societal and cultural and political sources of misery. When we hear the words disorder, disease, or illness, we think of an individual in need of treatment, not of a troubled society in need of transformation. Mental illness expansionism diverts us from examining a dehumanizing society. In addition to pathologizing normal behavior, the mental health profession also diverts us from examining a society that creates the ingredients. Helplessness, hopelessness, passivity, boredom, fear, and isolation that cause emotional difficulties. We are diverted from the reality that many emotional problems are natural human reactions to loss in our society of autonomy and community. Thus, the mental health profession not only has financial value for drug companies, but it has political value for those at the top of societal hierarchies who want to retain the status quo. Today, a handful of dissident mental health professionals do challenge and resist their profession's dehumanizing standard practices. I know several of these dissidents, and they are the only psychiatrists, psychologists, and mental health professionals that I have any respect for. Bruce Levine is a clinical psychologist. His website is brucelevine.net. He has wonderful articles. This published September 12, 2012, A Sane Approach to Psychiatric Drugs. July 11th, Take a Pill, Kill Your Sex Drive. Six Reasons Antidepressants Are Misnamed. Depression Treatment, What Works and How We Know. Anti-authoritarianism and schizophrenia. Do rebels who defy treatment do better? How psychiatry stigmatizes depression sufferers. How technology worship keeps Americans ignorant about depression treatment. How America's obsession with money deadens us. Would we have drugged up Einstein? How anti-authoritarianism is deemed a mental health problem. Will the young rise up and fight their indentured servitude to the student loan industry? A 400% rise in antidepressant pill use. Americans are disempowered. Can the Occupy Wall Street uprising shake us out of our depression? Clearly not.